Thank you. That concludes, <coughs> that concludes general questions. We're going to turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Jackson Carlo. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In September, while publicly berating opposition critics, the Education Secretary privately commissioned his officials to probe the increasing failure rate in hires. Will the First Minister today publish their findings? First Minister. Uh, we'll publish uh, findings uh, as and when we have them that uh, this Parliament should be aware of. But let me take issue with what uh, Jackson Carlaw just said there, because uh, the Deputy First Minister actually informed the Education and Skills Committee of this Parliament on the 27th of November of the analysis of the 2019 SQA results that he intended to carry out. You know, I don't think the Deputy First Minister can be held responsible if the Tories are incapable of paying attention to what's going on in, in Parliament. Jackson Carlo. Oh, sorry, that... Jackson Carlo. Uh, as always, uh, presiding officer, whilst it's not something I encourage, I always defend the right of people to express a view if they have the opportunity to do so. Um, that, there, that was interesting. Actually, I'm sorry, I wasn't actually on my feet fast enough. I hadn't realised that was it from the First Minister, because I see that she obviously intends to begin this year uh, in the same slippery fashion she ended the last. It wasn't just Conservatives. <laughs> It seems, to be, it seems to be the whole world that misunderstood what the, the, what the Cabinet Secretary had to say. So just to take the spin out of, of her answer, let's give the facts. In August last year, we learned that the number of students achieving A to C in hires had fallen. Mr Swinney promptly attacked us for daring to suggest this real something might be wrong with his handling of education. Then over Christmas, we learned that he had, at the same time, asked his officials to find out what's going wrong. Yesterday, in a letter to Shadow Education Secretary Liz Smith, Mr Swinney declared that he doesn't need to explain himself to this parliament because there's nothing new to say. That's what he had to say in his letter. I mean, I know education is no longer this government's number one priority, but doesn't that smack of arrogance even to the First Minister? First Minister. Can I gently suggest that perhaps Liz Smith should have a go at uh, better explaining things to Jackson Carlow? Uh, because Jackson Carlow has uh, stood up in this chamber and suggested, as the Tories have done over the recess, that John Swinney secretly commissioned an analysis of the 2019 exam results. Uh, John Swinney has pointed out the fact, I have done it again today, that actually he informed the Education and Skills Committee on the 27th of November that he had asked for such an analysis. So I do think it is Jackson Carlo uh, that should reflect on uh, the, the premise of the question that he is asking me today. Uh, of course, the Deputy First Minister uh, also informed the committee that forming, uh, following this analysis, uh, the partners have been asked to look at further work uh, to support learning and teaching through a number of actions. And of course, as that work progresses, the outcomes of it will be shared with the committee and with Parliament. Um, and it may be uh, that reason uh, that, as I understand it, although Jackson Carlow can correct me if I'm getting this wrong, that the Tories actually withdrew their request for a parliamentary statement this week when that information had uh, been pointed out to them. In terms of wider performance, uh, what we know in Scottish education is that, yes, there is more work to do, which is why it remains the top priority of this government. Uh, but we see attainment uh, increasing. So the percentage of school leavers getting a level five qualification, such as uh, nationals, it has increased from 71% uh, when we took office to 85, almost 86% now. Uh, also, the numbers getting uh, a higher qualification has increased from uh, less than half to now almost two thirds. Uh, and lastly, uh, we see for the first time ever, more than 30% of pupils achieving uh, at more than at least or more than five passes at higher uh, level, which is up from just over 20% in 2009. We also, of course, see the attainment gap reducing. So that's the progress that has been made in Scottish education. It is down to the hard work of teachers, pupils and parents across the country. And it's the progress we will focus on continuing to make. Jackson Carlo. So spin to the first question, denial to the second, spin and denial, the twin pillars of this government. And of course, we all pay tribute. We all pay tribute to the teachers, to the students and to the parents who are working hard. But let's return to the issue at hand. 
The Education Secretary asked a fair question of his officials. What does the falling pass rate at hires tell us about the health of education in this country? So let me put that question to the First Minister today and give her the opportunity to explain. What does a drop in the pass rate tell us about education? What does a record low in PISA scores tell us about school performance? What does declining school subject choice tell us about her government's record? First Minister. I've actually just set out a range of statistics which reflect uh, the real performance of Scottish education. Um, I can understand why Jackson Carlaw uh, chose not to listen to those because they don't suit the argument he is making. But let's not gloss over uh, the issue at hand, which of course was the subject of his first question to me. He might want to call it spin, but he has stood up in this chamber uh, and repeated an accusation against the Deputy First Minister that was made during the recess, which is flatly wrong. Uh, and I don't think that is acceptable. Uh, and I don't think Jackson Carlaw should get away with that. I think he should perhaps reflect on that and take the opportunity to apologise for it. Uh, we will continue to focus on the progress that is being uh, made. Uh, if we look at this year's exam results, uh, in fact, on the day they were published, the Deputy First Minister it recognised that there had been a fall in the overall uh, higher pass rate, although it remains uh, very high. But we saw generally a strong set of exam results with three quarters of candidates attaining a pass at higher grades A to C, uh, over a quarter of candidates achieving a grade A uh, at higher, and we saw an increase in entries and pass rates across National 5, including a rise in passes for English and a rise in passes uh, for maths. So, uh, coupled with the statistics I gave him in my previous answer, uh, I think that is a performance that shows improvement. I want to see more improvement, which is why uh, we will go on with the job at hand and leave Jackson, Carlaw and the Tories floundering around making baseless accusations. Jackson, Carlo. So basically, the Deputy First Minister's position is, I'm just so misunderstood. So misunderstood, in fact, that journalists, students, teachers, parents, all misunderstood what he had to say previously. Presiding officer, the issue here is really simple. Clearly, there is something wrong with our education system. Parents know it. Teachers know it. Students know it. And in private, this Education Secretary knows it too. The problem is that when it comes to action, we have a First Minister and Education Secretary more concerned with hiding their record than admitting to it or correcting it. First Minister, 2020 will be the year that this government's diabolical domestic record in education will come home to roost. A year when we will see an SNP government that will put its own survival in the light of events before the priorities of the people. Having promised five years ago that education would be her number one priority, is it not time to make it exactly that? First Minister. Well, of course, the, the people got the opportunity to cast their verdict on the performance of this government just a matter of weeks ago, and I think we all know how that ended up. But can I say to Jackson Carlow, and I say this really, really seriously, because I think the only people who have misunderstood uh, are the Scottish Tories, and I actually I am being charitable there, because actually I think what the... Tories are doing is not misunderstanding but misrepresenting and I think that is what they should be apologising for. Jackson Carlaw says that uh, the Deputy First Minister, myself, the government is seeking to quote hide a record. Here's what the Deputy First Minister said on the day uh, that the exam results uh, were published. He said and I am quoting there has been a fall in the overall pass rate. That doesn't strike me as trying to hide the matter. He then uh, says that somehow the Deputy First Minister, having denied that fact, commissioned in secret an analysis of why the pass rate had fallen. Uh, what I've told him today, what the Deputy First Minister told Liz Smith earlier this week, is that he informed the Education and Skills Committee of that on the 27th of November. Uh, perhaps it's the Scottish Conservatives that need to uh, wake up and pay a bit more attention. Yeah, this government will get on the job with the job uh, of improving performance in Scottish education. And perhaps Jackson Carlaw needs to think about making a less stuttering start to 2020. <laughs> Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. On the 17th of December, the Care Inspectorate served an improvement notice on South Lanarkshire Council's home care service for Hamilton, Lark Hall and Blantyre. Inspectors found hard-working staff feeling overwhelmed, stressed 
and frustrated. Care users, anxious, frightened and stressed. And a service that was chaotic and disorganised. The Council must make changes by the end of the month or face the real prospect of the Care Inspectorate cancelling their service registration. Does the First Minister accept that this situation is entirely without precedent in South Lanarkshire? And can she tell us what will happen to those of our most vulnerable people who depend on these vital home care services if the Council's registration is cancelled? First Minister. I expect the Council, and it is the Council's uh, responsibility, to take uh, the actions that have been recommended or instructed to it by the Care Inspectorate and to make sure that uh, what Richard Leonard has outlined today does not happen. Uh, the reason we have the Care Inspectorate is to make sure that we have the highest standards of care uh, across the country, and it's important that that system works properly and robustly. The responsibility of the government is to make sure that we work uh, with councils in the provision of health and social care and that we do that in a much more integrated way than has been the case in the past and that we, uh, as best we can, uh, within the resources that we have at our disposal, uh, we properly fund uh, local government services, which is why uh, in the budget for this financial uh, year, of course, uh, local government budget saw a real terms increase and we'll continue to work with councils to make sure that they deliver services that people, elderly people and everybody else across the country has a right to expect. Richard Leonard. On the 20th of December, just three days after serving the improvement notice on the Hamilton service, the Care Inspectorate issued another report, this time into South Lanarkshire Council's home care service for Rutherglen and Cambus Lang. It was another damning report. Inspectors highlighted practices they said were unsafe for both service users and care staff. Care users and their families are entitled to hold those responsible for the mismanagement of care services to account. First Minister, it has been almost five years since the integration of health and social care and still the system is not working. And this week, Scotland's councils have warned that this government's cuts have put their budgets at breaking point and put community services at risk. So will the First Minister accept that responsibility, of course, lies with councils like SNP South Lanarkshire, but it also lies with this SNP government as well? First Minister. Well, I think, um, again, if, if Richard Leonard had listened to my previous answer, he would have heard me talk about the responsibility of councils and the responsibility of this government. And our biggest responsibility is to work effectively in partnership. Uh, as I said earlier on, the reason we have a care inspector is to make sure that we have the highest standards of care across the country and it is right and proper that the care inspector uh, looks at service provision and where it considers it appropriate makes recommendations and the clear responsibility of any council is to respond to and address those recommendations and I would expect South Lanarkshire Council uh, to do exactly that. In terms of uh, the responsibility of my government to uh, integration of health and social care is an important reform. It is helping to deliver improvements in the delivery of social care. We are also investing. We are investing significantly more in the way of resource into uh, social care services and we'll continue to make that a priority. And of course, uh, within the confines of a budget that has been reduced over the past decade by a Conservative government at Westminster uh, that Richard Leonard and his colleagues uh, appear to be content to allow making the big decisions about budgets in Scotland. We have delivered in this financial year a real terms increase uh, for local government budgets. Of course, local governments work under pressure. Uh, this government financially works under pressure, but we will continue to work with local councils to make sure that delivery of local services is the priority and have the priority that they deserve. Richard Leonard. Well, let's fix on responsibility. The government is responsible for quadrupling the cuts to local government over the course of the last 10 years. And Cosler's claims are backed up by Audit Scotland. They reported at the end of last year that 19, 19 integration joint boards across Scotland required a financial bailout. And just over a year ago, we warned that acute pressures on social care services meant 
that they were reaching breaking point. And now, and now we have care services in the Minister for Older People's own constituency served with an improvement notice. First Minister, isn't it time that Scotland had a government that properly valued care services? Isn't it time that Scotland had a Scottish care service properly resourced with consistent standards, compassion for both staff and care users, one which meets their needs and respects, respects their rights? First Minister. Uh, as I said to Jackson Carlow, the people in Scotland have very recently had an opportunity to cast a verdict on the performance of this government and they uh, did that and we know the outcome of that. But let's look in detail here uh, at local government funding. Uh, because if we look at the, uh, at the time this year's budget was set, and if we take health out of the equation, because I think all of us, even the Tories, although their policies don't quite match their rhetoric, uh, accept that health should be protected, the Scottish Government's resource budget uh, will be 7.8% lower in real terms uh, this year compared to 2013-14. Uh, now, if you look at our funding to local government, we've managed to keep the pressure on local government beneath that uh, figure. So we've actually, in relative terms, protected local government. Uh, local government budgets have increased in recent years, uh, but because of the deep austerity over the past decade, yes, there's been a reduction over that period of time um, in local government budgets, but it's less in Scotland uh, than it is uh, in Labour-controlled Wales. So six point... No, but, but Labour don't like this. 6.2% pressure in Scotland over the same period, 11.5% in Labour-controlled Wales. So in a very difficult financial circumstance, this SNP government is doing more to protect local government than Labour has managed where they have the responsibility. And that might help to explain why the people of Scotland cast the verdict that they did cast in December in the general election. Thank you. We have a couple of constituency supplementaries. The first from Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last year, my constituent, Malcolm Muirhead, died after losing a stone and a half in a month whilst residing at the Drumbray Care Home run by City of Edinburgh Council. A social work report raised concerns that he was only being washed once a week in a sink. He had bloated, infected feet and overgrown nails. The home was closed to new admissions. This week, an unannounced visit by the care inspectorate found serious concerns about staff competence, about distribution of medication and treatment of residents. It will be deregistered in February if improvements are not made. Does the First Minister agree that this is symptomatic of a crisis in social care in our country and that our constituents have the right to expect a higher standard of care from public sector homes? First Minister. Let me certainly agree in part uh, with Alec Cole Hamilton. I think what he has described here is completely unacceptable. And yes, I do uh, believe that residents of care homes and their families uh, have an absolute right to expect better standards than those that Alec Cole Hamilton has outlined in the case, uh, the very uh, tragic case of Malcolm Muirhead. Uh, where I, I don't agree, and uh, I, this is a, a disagreement that I uh, will express here sincerely, that it is symptomatic, to use his words, of a wider crisis in social care. Social care is under pressure, as is health care, as are public services, because of uh, the austerity. Well, the Labour are shouting, whose fault is that? The architects and the authors of austerity, which are the Tories at Westminster, previously helped by the Liberal Democrats. That's whose fault it is. And actually, it's to escape that that I take a very different view on the future of this parliament than other parties in this chamber. We will continue, as I have outlined in detail today, uh, within a very constrained budget, we will continue to take the action uh, that, as best we can, protects health and protects social care. That's what we have done, and it is what we will continue to do. Neil Findlay. In October, I raised with the First Minister the case of my constituent who has been waiting on an operation. She has severe neurological pain, has been off work for a very long time and has to take 48 tablets a day to try to alleviate the agony that shoots through her head and face every few seconds. Following my question, the Cabinet Secretary for Health wrote to me saying, there is no suggestion of any kind that the delay to the new Department of Clinical Neurosciences has anything to do with the case of your constituent. And, that, and I quote, my constituent's case would be resolved by NHS Lothian. 
Well, my constituent's case still has not been resolved by NHS Lothian. She remains in agony, has had her op operation cancelled again, she, and, and has been told by NHS Lothian officials again that this is due to the lack of staff and the lack of theatre space because of the Sick Kids Neurological Centre debacle. So will the First Minister today take this opportunity to speak directly to my constituent who is watching this session and give her some hope that her living hell will end soon? First Minister. Well, I, as, I, I, as I always do uh, readily when any individual does not get the standard of care that they have a right to expect on the NHS, <coughs> uh, apologise to them and I will uh, do that to your constituent today. Um, as Neil Finlay has said, uh, it was raised before the Health Secretary uh, wrote to Neil Finlay. Neil Finlay clearly and his constituent clearly and understandably do not consider that the issue has been resolved. I will therefore ask the Health Secretary today uh, to look again at this issue uh, and to liaise with NHS Lothian and uh, respond as quickly as possible to Neil Finlay when she's had an opportunity to do so. Thank you. So we're just going to have a short suspension. Parliament is suspended. We will resume First Minister's questions. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Government often quotes the work of Professor Philip Alston, the UN Rapporteur on Poverty and Human Rights. His report said transport should be considered an essential service, equivalent to water and electricity, and that the Government should ensure that people living in rural areas are adequately served. We're a long way off that vision at the moment. Since devolution, bus fares have almost doubled, so it's no surprise that passenger numbers are down 15%. Many of Scotland's communities are so poorly served that people feel they've got no choice but to drive, and the situation is getting worse, not better. We can change this. Scottish Green proposals to give councils the power to run local bus services, improving reliability and fares were included in the recent transport bill. What practical help is the Scottish Government giving to our local councils to help them use those powers? First Minister. Uh, well, we have given uh, local government those powers. It's for local government to decide how they want to use those powers as and on any other use of powers. We will always be open to and willing to have a discussion with local government about how we can support them uh, to do that. Uh, I very much want to see, and uh, the Scottish Government very much wants to see, an increase in uh, people using our bus services, not just in rural parts of the country, although that is particularly important, but across all parts of our country. That is why one of the key commitments in uh, last year's uh, programme for government was the uh, £500 million uh, investment in improving bus infrastructure because often the barrier, Patrick Harvey's right, sometimes the barrier is cost, but often the barrier is a lack of uh, convenience and flexibility. So we want to improve that and through the range of policies that we are undertaking, that's uh, what we are determined to do. Patrick Harvey. <coughs> Well, that £500 million on infrastructure is welcome, but it's spread over a very long period of time, and it's a fraction of what the government is spending on new road capacity. We all know that transport in Scotland is unfair, unhealthy, costly, and pushing carbon emissions up when they should be coming down. We urgently need to ensure that public transport is always the cheapest and most convenient option for people. With First Group moving out of its UK bus operations, there is a clear, immediate opportunity across Scotland, including Glasgow and Aberdeen, to bring those services back into public ownership. But it won't happen without clear, proactive support from the Scottish Government. It's time to end the power of the private operators who cherry-pick the profitable routes and instead build a public transport system that works for the public interest. Will the First Minister be bold and ensure that this happens across Scotland, urban and rural alike, so that all communities can be served by a quality, integrated transport network that's fit for the 21st century? First Minister. Well, of course, we have already taken 
important action in that regard. The Transport Scotland Act 2019, which Patrick Harvey has already referred to, made important steps in the right direction, giving uh, local government new powers. Uh, alongside that, of course, as I mentioned in my previous answer, we are going to deliver uh, transformational long-term funding uh, for better bus infrastructure. Uh, of course, that is an addition, and this is uh, a very important point to uh, the £260 million every year that we currently invest in bus services. Uh, but I absolutely agree that we need to have a, a convenient, flexible, integrated bus service that is much easier and more convenient for people to use. The Bus Partnership uh, Fund uh, will deliver that step change to improve uh, the, the offer that buses can make uh, to people. Uh, Patronage on our buses has been declining for a long, long time, for my entire lifetime and probably before that, I think from the 1960s. Uh, and we need to turn that around. And we need to turn that around by making sure it's affordable, but also making sure that it is convenient and flexible for people to use. And that's exactly uh, what, through the legislation and the additional funding, uh, we are determined and very focused on doing. Thank you. Question number four, Willie Rennie. The memorandum of understanding between Heathrow Airport and the Scottish Government supports 40 new long-haul flights, the growth of domestic flights and a £10 discount for every domestic passenger for 20 years. It's a plan for an expansion of the airline industry and it is fully endorsed by this Scottish Government. Last May, the First Minister promised me that she would review the Scottish Government's support for Heathrow expansion, following the recommendations of the Committee on Climate Change. What was the outcome of that review? First Minister. We are still reviewing policies right across the Government as part of the process of updating uh, the Climate Change Action Plan. In fact, the Cabinet had a discussion uh, on the Climate Change Action Plan plan and the progress we're making uh, towards that uh, just this week. So when we set that out across aviation and across a whole range of uh, the government's responsibilities, we will set out what we need to do differently. Uh, on Heathrow in particular, I, I should remind uh, Willie Rennie when that Heathrow uh, last came to a vote in the House of Commons, SNP MPs did not vote uh, for it. Uh, but we took the view as a Scottish Government, because we're not in control of the decision about a third runway at Heathrow, uh, but if it is going ahead, then Scotland should seek to maximise economic uh, impact and benefit from that. But the climate emergency, the updated advice from the Committee on Climate Change, our responsibilities not just to meet but to exceed uh, the obligations in the Paris Agreement mean we need to review all of that. That's exactly what the government is doing. We're doing that with a, a rigorously and a vigorously open mind. Some of what uh, comes out of that will be challenging and I would uh, bet my life right now that some uh, hopefully not on the basis of uh, the, the tenor of his question today, Willie Rennie, but some in this chamber will oppose some of what we have to do to meet our climate change obligations. But we are absolutely determined that having set those world-leading targets, we have to take the action now to ensure that we can meet them and lead the world by example. Thank you. We have some <coughs> further supplementaries. The first from... Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Mr Rennie. <laughs> Willie Rennie. <laughs> It's my fault. It is my fault, not I, Mr. Rennie's fault, Mr. Rennie. I, I know they don't. I know they don't want to hear it, President Officer. <laughs> they don't want to hear it, and we know why. This is months on, First Minister, and you are still reviewing the case of support for Heathrow expansion. Still reviewing it. This is urgent. This is a crisis right now. If our MPs haven't supported it at Westminster, why is she still supporting Heathrow expansion here in Scotland? Climate change has brought Zambia to the brink of famine. Australia has been burning since September. The ice caps continue to melt. Yet the First Minister continues to support Heathrow expansion. When COP26 delegates come to Glasgow, will the First Minister be able to look them in the eye and say she is doing everything she can on climate change. First Minister. Yes, is the answer to that. But let me go back to a really important point here because, uh, unless I'm remembering this incorrectly, I don't think I am, the Liberal Democrats voted for the new Climate Change Act just a matter of weeks. Uh, ago. That Climate Change Act put a responsibility on the Scottish Government uh, to bring forward an updated climate change plan within six months uh, of 
draft within six months uh, of uh, Royal Assent by the end of April. That's the process we're going right through right now to make sure we come forward with a comprehensive plan of action to meet the targets in that Act. That is actually the right and responsible way for a government determined to tackle climate change to behave. And let me say, when we come forward uh, with that plan, I hope that Willie Rennie will have the courage uh, of his own convictions because he has because it is First Minister's questions before he reminds me of that, rightly posed questions to me today. But I could equally ask Willie Rennie why, in light of the climate change crisis that we face, his party still opposes things like the workplace parking levy to try to get people out of their cars. Uh, so all of us across this chamber and across society have big questions to ask of ourselves and to answer, and this government will not be found wanting. I'm not sure that the same can be said of the opposition when it comes to the detail of this debate. Further supplementaries from Kenneth Gibson to be filled by Jackie Bailey. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister share my concern that Amendment 9 passed at Stage 2 of the Non-Domestic Rates Scotland Bill by Green, Tory and Labour MSPs, which abolishes uniform non-domestic rates, will lead to the loss of over £300 million of rates relief to businesses across Scotland each and every year? And does she agree that Parliament should seek to reverse Amendment 9 when we get to Stage 3 of the Bill, as advocated by the Scottish Retail Consortium, yeah. Union of Shop, Distributive and Allied Workers, Federation of Small Businesses yeah. and many others? Yeah. First Minister. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, I strongly uh, agree with that. Uh, I think the amendment, which would of course uh, remove uniform business rates, would make it virtually impossible for this government to continue to provide the support we currently provide to small businesses. And uh, Kenny Gibson has just outlined uh, the breadth and depth of opposition to that amendment. And I don't think anybody uh, in any party in this chamber uh, can claim to be on the side of small businesses, the length and breadth of our country, if they do not vote to reverse this amendment at the next opportunity. And I hope members across parliament will reflect very seriously on that. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Ros Greer. The First Minister may be aware that Osdor, the Retail Workers' Union, were campaigning outside the Parliament today to end New Year's Day trading for large stores. Many retail workers in Scotland had to work on the 1st of January instead of spending time with their families. This Parliament already has legislation in place covering Christmas and New Year Day trading, which would stop large stores from opening, but the New Year's Day provisions have not been implemented. Will the First Minister commit today to backing us doors calls, consult on New Year's Day trading, and give shop workers the festive break that they deserve? First Minister. Uh, well, I, I do think shop workers uh, deserve uh, a festive break like the rest of us uh, get the benefit of. Uh, I will uh, commit today to uh, looking very carefully at the USDA campaign. I absolutely understand uh, the motivations uh, driving that campaign and to consider what further steps this government can take uh, to address some of those concerns. And when I've had the opportunity to do so, uh, I'll be happy to ask the relevant minister to reply in detail to Jackie Bailey. Thank you. Ross Greer to be followed by Gillian Martin. Thank you. The First Minister has been critical of the American government's escalation of military conflict with Iran. So I'd like to ask if she's taken the one measure available to the Scottish government to restrict that escalation. Has the Scottish government taken any steps to restrict US military use of Presswick Airport, which this government owns on behalf of the Scottish public? First Minister. Presswick Airport, of course, uh, operates commercially and at arm's length from the Scottish Government. If it didn't do so, we would not be able to keep it open in the way that we have. Uh, of course, we expect uh, Presswick Airport to operate ethically, as we do uh, any company, and we will continue uh, as a government to speak up for international law, uh, for human rights, uh, whether in the context of Iran and the recent uh, very worrying developments in Iran, uh, or indeed, for that matter, in a wider context. Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Yesterday, this Parliament voted overwhelmingly to refuse consent to the UK Government's UK Withdrawal Bill from the EU. If Westminster now, as we expect they will, press ahead and legislate in devolved areas without the consent of the Scottish Parliament, I'd like to ask the First Minister what the implications for devolution settlement and our democracy are. First Minister. Uh, well, the refusal of Parliament yesterday uh, to the withdrawal agreement, uh, Westminster withdrawal agreement, of course, reflects the uh, opposition, the strong opposition 
uh, of course, reaffirmed as recently as the general election in December of the people of Scotland to Brexit. So we have a situation now where the vast majority of people in Scotland do not want Brexit. This parliament has refused to give its consent to the legislation facilitating Brexit. And if we are in a situation, which I think Gillian Martin is uh, right, sadly, to anticipate that the Westminster government continues to ride roughshod over the views of this parliament and the wider Scottish public, then what they will be demonstrating is the UK as currently constituted uh, cannot accommodate the differing views of people in Scotland. And the lesson I take from that is that people in Scotland deserve the opportunity to choose a different future and to choose to become an independent country and protect our place within the European Union. Question number five, George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister whether she will provide an update on the proposed Glasgow Metro Rail System that will connect Glasgow Airport to the rail network. First Minister. Improving connectivity for the region is a priority of the Glasgow City Region deal, uh, to which the Scottish Government has committed £500 million uh, to the total £1.13 billion. Uh, we're committed to improving connectivity to Glasgow Airport in the 2019 programme for government. We welcomed uh, the Glasgow Connectivity Commission report and committed to consideration of a Glasgow Metro as part of the second strategic transport project review. That review is the largest strategy and transport appraisal for a decade. Work on it is underway and it will make recommendations in early 2021 on transport interventions which are required to deliver the priorities and outcomes of the new national transport strategy. In addition to this, Transport Scotland officials have already committed to working with the relevant local authorities to inform the ongoing appraisal of the Metro proposal. George Adam. I thank the First Minister for her answer. The connect connectivity to Glasgow Airport has been debated for many years. The current proposal is the most ambitious yet and the best option to provide opportunities for the airport and Paisley. Does the First Minister support the case for a Glasgow Metro stopping at the airport and Paisley Gilmer Street and agree that it will have significant benefits not only for the airport but for Paisley, Renfrewshire and the south side of Glasgow? First Minister. Um, yes, I do have uh, enormous sympathy with the case that the Council is putting forward as uh, the MSP for the south side of Glasgow. That is uh, one of the reasons, of course, why we have committed to working constructively with partners to consider these proposals and to consider them carefully and seriously. Um, I absolutely recognise the potential it has to enhance connectivity, including to the airport and to Paisley. Um, and again, that's why the programme for government committed to appraising the scheme in the strategic transport review. Um, that, I think, is the right way uh, to proceed. There will undoubtedly also be challenges, which is why it's important that we work closely with local authorities, which is what Transport uh, Scotland uh, have committed to doing. Jamie Green to be followed by Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. Can I add my welcome to the fact that progress has been made on this issue? But can the First Minister provide one simple reassurance, and that's that her government is entirely committed that no matter what the end solution looks like, that Glasgow Airport will actually be connected to the city of Glasgow itself? First Minister. Well, I've I've already made my views pretty clear on the importance of good and better connectivity to Glasgow Airport. I don't think any responsible government can stand here and say, regardless of what the end solution looks like, uh, we will go ahead and do something. It's absolutely vital that we go through proper processes. There hasn't uh, yet uh, been uh, a full uh, business uh, appraisal of uh, the case, business case made for the metro system. That's part of the work that still requires to be done. Uh, so I think the government's position in uh, committing to appraising this as part of the strategic transport review of Transport Scotland agreeing to work with the councils is the best way to take forward the case for this and also collectively to consider how that can be uh, delivered. I think it is important uh, also to say that while uh, we all and I uh, certainly understand the merits uh, of uh, a proposal like this, a potential investment of this scale must be subject to normal processes and in particular to normal statutory processes as well. Neil Bibby. First Minister, we've been here before, promises made and people let down. In 2009, the SNP government cancelled the Glasgow Airport Rail Link. In 2019, the SNP cancelled another Glasgow Airport Rail Link. They now appear to have cancelled the personal rapid transit to Glasgow Airport. So when does the First Minister think she'll cancel this latest project? First Minister. Well, again, I would say to Neil Bibby that throughout that period there have been many opportunities for the people of Glasgow to make their views known on the actions and performance of this government. And the outcome of that hasn't been particularly pleasant for the Scottish or the Glasgow Labour Party. Um, 
This is a proposal that has been taken forward by councils in the region. Uh, that is the whole purpose of the Glasgow uh, City Region deal, to ensure that those councils can decide on their priorities and to take them forward. This government will support them as they do that. I've set out the ways in which we will support them. Um, and as we do so, uh, we will continue to work hard to ensure that this government and this party retains the confidence of the people of Glasgow that was demonstrated again just a few weeks ago. Yeah. Question eight, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that local authorities are having to spend millions of pounds from cash reserves in order to balance their budgets. First Minister. Well, my first response, of course, is uh, to sympathise with local councils who, like this government, are bearing the brunt of Conservative austerity. Um, Local authorities, of course, have a duty to set a balanced budget and they uh, have to decide how they do that. In 2019-20, the Scottish Government, for its part, provided local government with a settlement of £11.2 billion. Uh, taken to get that in itself was a uh, real terms increase, but taken together with the flexibility around council tax, uh, local authorities have had access to an additional £602 million, a real terms funding increase of 3.8%. It's up to individual local authorities to take their own final budgetary decisions on how to utilise this package of funding to deliver the positive outcomes that people across Scotland expect and deserve. And all councils, of course, uh, will consider properly the use of any cash reserves where they consider it is prudent to do so. Alexander Stewart. I thank the First Minister for that response. The recent report from the Accounts Commission states that councils face increasing challenges in meeting changing and growing demands for services. Council income is straining to keep pace at a 7.6% decline in real terms since 2013-14. The Scottish Government are piling on additional pressure to councils through priorities in education and home care, which is having a detrimental effect on their finances. First Minister, your government has been in charge for 12 years and during that time you have systematically eroded resources which are a lifeline to local authorities. So when will you take responsibility to provide councils with the necessary funds they deserve to support the communities that they represent? First Minister. Well, Alexander, my apologies, Stuart, is nothing if not brave. Um, <laughs> you know, local authorities are working under real pressure. Uh, that is because of the austerity that has been posed on this government by Alexander Stewart's party. You know, the Accounts, the accounts Commission found that local government resource budgets had gone down uh, by around 6% in real terms since 2013. Uh, I think that was the period they were uh, talking about. Uh, but over that same period, uh, the Scottish government's budget was 7.8% lower uh, in real terms than it had been in 2013 as a direct result of Tory austerity. Um, but take that 6% figure for local uh, government in Scotland, which shows that in relative terms, the Scottish Government has acted to protect local government. But what's the equivalent of that 6% figure when we look at Tory-run England? Uh, I don't know whether Alexander Stewart wants to get up again and tell me. On the assumption that he doesn't, the equivalent figure is 22.8% real terms reduction in local government funding imposed on English local authorities by a Conservative government. So I will take no lectures from the Tories when it comes to local government funding. And of course, my last point, presiding officer, if we'd followed the advice of the Scottish Conservatives exactly. and given tax cuts to the richest in our society, local government services would be struggling even more. I think this is one of the many reasons the Tories lost more than half their seats at the general election. Question number seven, Ian Gray. to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that 14,000 applicants missed out on a place at university last year. First Minister. Uh, UCAS data covering 2019 show that over 35,700 Scottish students were accepted to a UK university and 94% of Scottish 18-year-olds who applied through UCAS received at least one offer of a place. That's actually the highest level uh, since 2009. 
In 2017-18, there was a record high number of Scottish domiciled full-time first degree entrants to Scottish higher education institutions, which is an increase of nearly 16% since 2006-07. Ian Gray. And yet it is the case that it's three, uh, three years uh, since Audit Scotland told the government that they have failed to raise the cap on numbers for Scottish domiciled students studying at Scottish universities uh, in order to meet increased demand. Indeed, the number of would-be students missing out on university has almost doubled under the SNP. Uh, and for those who do get into university, funding has been cut by £700 per student. So will the First Minister now commit to restore university funding and review the cap on university places to increase and widen access for students from all backgrounds? First Minister. Well, I'll perhaps repeat for Ingrid's benefit uh, the information I gave him in my first answer. Uh, we've seen uh, since 2006-07 a 16% increase in Scottish domiciled full-time first degree entrants to Scottish higher education uh, institutions. Uh, the 2019 uh, figures uh, that he has referred to today, in terms of acceptances, it's the third highest number of acceptances uh, on record, and the numbers uh, not getting a place uh, at university is at the lowest level since 2009. So that's the record of this government, because we are continuing to invest strongly um, in higher education and support uh, young people to go to university. In terms of uh, student support, we've uh, also raised the uh, HE bursary income threshold from 19,000 to 21,000. We've increased bursary support for the poorest young students uh, from £1,875 a year to £2,000 a year. We've increased bursary support for the poorest independent students in higher education as well. We've introduced the care experience uh, bursary and removed the age cap on that. Uh, all within a budget that the Labour Party have sat by and watched the Tories have the right to reduce over the past decade. Uh, so whether it's on health, whether it's on education, within a constrained budget, this government is doing the job of delivering the best we can for people across Scotland, which again is probably why people in Scotland express confidence in this government when they last had the chance to do so. Thank you. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to members' business in the name of Maurice Corrie on the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, but we'll just have a short suspension to allow the gallery to clear and members and ministers to change seats. A short suspension.